Welcome to the Equestrian Experience, a show where we talk about what happens behind the rosettes and what we've tried so that you don't have to. In a world first, we and our guests openly share what we know from our extensive equestrian experience. This includes our exclusive access to global experts such as high performance national vets, coaches, farriers, and even brands. If you're new here, consider subscribing. We're your hosts, Amanda Ross and Bex Mason, and today we're talking to the up-and-coming Australian rider who's really making her mark on the elite eventing circuit, Shanae Lowings. Shanae, welcome to the podcast, and hey, Bex, how are you guys? I'm really good. Hello, Shanae. Hey, everyone. How are you? Good, really good. good. It's good to be back podcasting. Um, so, Shanae, I've obviously known you for a while, so as a fellow Australian event rider, um, you are really making your mark on the senior squad and the senior eventing scene. And I think it's probably excellent timing with the World Equestrian Games coming up. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you started? And I'm sure as we go on, we'll talk about your recent amazing win at Melbourne CCI. Um, where did you begin? Well, um, it wasn't until I was about maybe seven or eight years old i was living mm -hmm. in a suburban house in perth Atterdale was the little suburb it was called and my parents growing up were a little bit horsey so mum used to do a bit of hacking and they lived in the hunter valley which was quite a horsey place and mm -hmm. dad used to train trotters with his brother oh trotters um and then yeah a bit different <laughs> And then um, one day we were just, yeah, had nothing to do with horses. And I pretty much said to mum and dad that I want to go horse riding. Mm -hmm. And so they took me to a local horse riding place. And that's where it all started. And pretty much I never stopped riding since. <laughs> um, dad used to take me to the races a lot because my mm -hmm. pop was actually a bookkeeper. Really? So that's probably wow. how it all started. Yeah. Wow. So I used to go there all the time and try to learn everything I could about the gallopers and always wanted to ride them. And I thought that if, um, if pop found me a foal, I'd be able to ride it. Cause I was only very small, <laughs> not knowing anything. But no, that is, um, <laughs> that's definitely how it started. And then, um, yeah, I moved to, so from that riding school, I went to another riding school where I found my first pony mm -hmm. who was a proper hacking pony. And I really wanted to um, do eventing. I watched oh. all the badmintons on the DVDs mm -hmm. and I just thought that looked really fun and I loved going really fast. <laughs> so and, too fast for yeah. hacking. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and I tried to make my hacking pony a eventer, and I must say he was a good little pony, but he didn't really like water, and he didn't he didn't really like the the cross country. <laughs> I love how you had that passion from when you were really young. You clearly knew that you wanted to be an event rider. Yeah, I um now I think about it, I just used to literally watch those events on repeat, the badminton, the burleys, because you used to be able to get all those um circuits on the dvd mm. um and yeah and then from there i went to a another adjustment center where i properly started eventing and then went to sonia johnson in when i was still in western australia and i was probably about 15 maybe yeah probably 15 and started to um go up the grades a bit so it's really interesting that, like, for anyone that's not from Australia, you know, Perth is way over west um, and it's very isolated from the east side of Australia where most of the action is. And yet you've, you know, had a couple of very good riders, one that you mentioned, Sonia Johnson, who have represented Australia coming from Perth. Um, tell us a little bit about the distances that you have to travel and how different is it um, trying to event in Perth versus obviously the reason you came over to, to Sydney? Yeah, well... Perth has fantastic events. They are very well run. Um, it's a great community. They put everything they can into the event. Mm -hmm. um, I just I just found myself always traveling over east and it is a very, very long journey. It takes about four days to get there. Oh, um, wow. And it's, it is quite massive. Like it's 
yeah, about 4,000 kilometres between Perth and Sydney. Mm -hmm. um, and just doing that over and over again, I then decided that Sydney was where I wanted to be. Um, I just love competing against all those top riders. It really made you um, put into perspective where you're sitting um, and how much better you need to get to beat yeah. them. <laughs> um, so that was really my main my main drive on on doing the move, on making the move. Yeah. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because being from Australia, we don't get to visit the badmintons and the burleys and all of those events that you were talking about watching, you know, on DVD. And I remember the same thing as a kid. I think I had them all on repeat and it was the one way to look <laughs> at the most amazing stuff that was going on overseas. So until we actually got to get on a plane or go and see it for ourselves, it, yeah, I think we've, we've all watched every single video a million times over as kids to be inspired. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is so great listening yep. to you two saying that you watched it all on DVDs so whereas I'm so lucky being here being in England and getting to go to those events you know I've grown up going to those events so it's very normal for me <laughs> and I love the passion that comes to you you've watched it on DVD and it's a dream to go there um, it's brilliant and as you were saying about Perth I mean that's the most isolated city in the world is it not so um, it makes sense <laughs> to you to have made pretty much is move. at the moment <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, absolutely um, Shanae, can you tell us a little bit about the preparation that you have to do with the horses in order to travel that far? Because um, I was actually chatting with one of our um, Australian para dressage riders and she was saying that she um, is in Europe and that she might have to travel for three or four days to go to a qualifier, but the travel is so different because you're driving through congested traffic and through cities and, you know, it's, it's completely different yeah. to going from Perth to Sydney. So. Um, what's on the roads? What do you have to prepare for? Uh, what are those sort of danger points that nobody really thinks about that you need to know about before you set off? Um, well, there's many factors definitely to consider when you're traveling that distance. Um, definitely, definitely the first is to make sure that your horse is healthy and happy and just providing them with the best care that's going to get them through the trip is essential. So we'd always make sure that, um, they had good feed on board. We gave them um, like an antibiotic pace, which just helped for any, um, you know, travel sickness they may get because they don't get to put their heads down as much being in their um, truck for so long. Mm -hmm. um, and just really planning the trip. So we um, had stopping points, which was about every seven to eight hours. And mm -hmm. we'd make sure that we had a stop that had a big yard that they can walk around in. Um, good fresh water and they can put their heads down and just chill out for for a bit before the next journey. How long would those stopovers be? Well, um, just during the day uh, is probably no more than an hour and a half because they are really long okay. days and you do just want to get there um, at your final mm. destination pretty much before dark mm. so they can see where mm. they are. Um, and then we, yeah, when we get there, they have a full, probably eight hours off during the night, um, if not more. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, start again early the next morning, but we definitely don't have, um, heavy congestion traffic going across the <laughs> Nullarbor, like you were saying with the Australian rider overseas, it's yeah. pretty much just a uh, long, boring, it shouldn't say boring roads. They are, they do get boring after a while, but there is a road called the, um, <laughs> 90 miles straight so that's literally a um a road with no turns for 90 miles that is very boring on anyone's yeah. radar <laughs> um straight yeah <laughs> and do you have to watch out for uh, kangaroos and anything else that happens to be crossing your path oh definitely there's um you see a lot of roos so you you do try you have to be careful on dawn and dusk that's your main um Mm -hmm. that's the main time that they're out and there's wombats emus they're probably the only wildlife i've seen there are camels out there but i'm pretty pretty glad i haven't seen a camel because <laughs> you wouldn't want to hit one of them <laughs> oh my god no that'd be very random <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah it sounds like a massive adventure absolutely it is a great adventure and they do always they come out the other side very well um it's, it's always surprising and you make sure you monitor them every day. You take their temperatures morning and night just to make sure that they're, they're still happy and healthy and mm -hmm. they always get there looking amazing. So it's not too hard on them. I mean, it must be quite daunting when you first set up on one of those big trips because you're 
but if you've never done it before and not knowing you know how the horses are going to come out the other end but is it one of those that the more you do it the more you get used to it you've got a little bit of a routine um is there anything that's really thrown you off like a thrown a curveball into your journey before like a flat tire or has it all been pretty plain sailing yeah well i've actually been pretty lucky to be doing um convoy trips with Sonia Johnson most of the time who is a very experienced traveler so I was pretty lucky in that regard and yeah you do hit curveballs like I have um I think I've only actually blown the one tire on the trip and it all works out fine I I I couldn't say that anything that happened was was so bad but no it was absolutely fine you kind of manage everything as you go along and it all works out okay very good to hear. So, Sinead, like talking a little bit more about yourself and as, as an elite event rider, um, I'm really interested in knowing what it's like in Australia to get started in elite sport. And I think it'd be really good if you could share with some of our listeners. Um, like I've heard about the development programs and squads. Can you tell me how does an Australia rider going from being regularly to com- competitive to being on any sort of a radar to the selectors? Yeah, well, I guess like any other sport it takes a lot of dedication and hard work to be an elite athlete and ever since I started riding competitive competitively when I was about 13 or 14 I always wanted to be the best I could and ride at that very top level um so I just I absolutely wanted to be the best horsewoman I could to make sure I was providing my horse with the best care and information as well um I definitely surrounded myself with the best people I could so I never missed an opportunity to learn and I also have these people to guide you and help me produce and potentially find a good horse to get you through the grade successfully which is the start of being recognized and put you on those developing squads. I've been very lucky to work closely with top riders like Sonia Johnson when I was back in WA and I then made the move to the New South to New South Wales and base myself with Craig and Prue Barrett for four years. Mm -hmm. And then from there, moved down to Shane and Nikki Roses at Bimbadeen Park, which I was for the last two years. Mm -hmm. I must say like they have been such a huge influence on where I am today and I still work very closely with them. Um, So definitely putting yourself and surrounding yourself with those people is definitely a huge milestone into getting to where you want to go and then we're so lucky to have the squads like the young um the young and developing squads and then moving into the high performance squads as well um because that just gives us younger riders and more experienced riders access to the top coaches that these programs are pretty much how i came across working with prue barrett uh who is my dressage and cross country coach well she pretty much helps me all round um, yeah. That came across Rod Brown as well, who helps me in the show jumping, mm-hmm. and been pretty luckily, pretty lucky since Melbourne through EA High Performance to start um, using Bettina Hoy. So that's been very influential. Yeah, she's fantastic, and she's so enthusiastic. So I would say, would you say it's a combination? Like you've spoken really highly of all the people you've trained with and all the people you've met along your journey so far. So would you say it's a combination of the results that you've had or do you need to just do a lot of networking yeah so definitely surrounding yourself with those people are very influential in producing the results mm. and not to mention by getting on the squads it gives you the opportunities as well with the um, Oceania championships um, so that gets you in a team environment and makes you experience those extra team pressures that can you know, impact you when you go to the Olympics and World Games. So I find that really important that you do experience them coming through the grades and developing as a rider. Um, but yeah, that there, there's just so many um, factors that can make you an elite athlete. But I, I strongly think that surrounding yourself with a strong team um, is essential for, for any rider coming yeah. through. Of all of the people that you've named, which are all our top riders in Australia, can you share with our listeners, um, say sort of for each rider that you've worked with or each coach that you've worked with, is there something that each one of those has 
um, has taught you like one particular thing? And I'm just, what I'm trying to understand here is to give people the opportunity to see what they can learn from these riders and what has been really important to you um, with working with a bunch of different and very successful riders. The main thing that pops into my head that relates all of the riders would be their drive and dedication. Um, all the riders I've, I've, I've named, like Sonia, Shane, Prue, um, they've all, they all work so hard for what they have. And I think that's, that's really important because it is such a tough sport and it, it doesn't come easy. And I think it's really important that you do learn that from, you know, a, a younger age coming up because it's, it's definitely not easy, but if you want to put in the hard works and, and be the best, then that's definitely what they, they um, showed me from a younger age. Mm-hmm. And what about time management and um, attention to detail or horse management? Are there, is there anybody that's been particularly like good at each of those type of things? Because I remember when I was starting teams, Jill Rolton was finishing doing teams. And the one thing that everybody said about Jill was that she would not leave the stables in a team environment. She would keep everybody waiting in the team bus because she wasn't happy with the bandage on the horse's leg. So she would go back there <laughs> and she would rewrap it and make sure there wasn't a crinkle in it. And she didn't mind if everybody else has to wait because her horse's legs were the most important thing. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's interesting. That's, that's good though. Mm. Um, yeah. Well, they, I guess everyone at that level has, um, very similar horse management skills and I think being um, very thorough at that level is really important and I guess um, you know being based with Shane Rose where I have been the last two years uh, we would always trot them up the day after a gallop um, we have essential um, you know, after care for cross country. So every horse would be, um, there'd be a literal routine that you do for each horse after cross country. So you'd ice them, you need to re-ice them and then um, trot them up before you go to bed and put cool as leg clay on and then wrap them up. And mm -hmm. I guess little things like that is something that I'll continue doing. And yeah, definitely being on those squads as well. You get access to the team vets like Nathan mm -hmm. Anthony, um, who I've been very luckily, very lucky to learn off. There's a lot, there's so many things, isn't there? Um, and Bettina, so, Bettina, I think is, um, I remember competing, you know, sort of against her in that era. And we always looked up to her because she was incredibly um, diligent and um, left no stone unturned. She was an incredible rider on the flat. Um, and all of her horses looked really, really schooled. Um, and then she's also a very successful rider and as a Grand Prix dressage rider herself. How did her training influence you recently in the um, Oceana squad lead up? Um, well, I was really, really excited to hear that we were working with Bettina because for all those reasons that you just said, um, I really, really enjoy the dressage phase, I, it, which isn't, quite normal sometimes for an event rider but I really I really love it and mm -hmm. I guess um, being able to work with her and just all her fanatical um, methods and just her um, attention to detail which I wouldn't have thought that um, like I, I had quite a good attention to detail but nothing on her level so it was wow. really um really good to learn just you know something that you think is good you may have missed something that mm -hmm. is so minor but in the big picture is quite major mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. she's very very systematic as well so everything um you know f for the horse's sake i guess nothing surprises them so everything is mm -hmm. um almost makes sense to them you keep it quite simple in a way that you work them Mm -hmm. to a point quite hard that they improve and don't get confused mm -hmm. about it, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. so um, like and just the and way just she... Follow the process. Yeah, yeah. And definitely her... Um, she was quite very, very... I shouldn't say quite. She was very tough on your rider's position as well. So she made you use um, every part of your body to 
make the horse perform better really so um just making you yeah just she was just very good I could go on and on and on but mm-hmm. yeah just her um tech technicality and her system was was really great to learn from that's one common thread that you you've spoken about so far the whole way through our conversation is the attention to detail and how you can break it down you know if you're doing something it's those one percent gains isn't it so if you can improve 1% here and 1% yeah. there and 1% there, then that is going to make you the top athlete. Um, and not looking at it as such a big picture, I suppose it's breaking it all down. And going to the, the fantastic trainers that, that you've had, it's being able to, I suppose, well, break it down into little tiny pieces in a different way that you've never seen it before and then build it back up together. And you seem very open-minded. You seem to just love learning continuously. Like I can see by your face how excited you got when you said you were going to go and train with Fatina Hoy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I um, well, I guess that's how you you get better is learning and taking bits from everyone. And um, yeah, I always take every opportunity I can, really. So that was an amazing opportunity. So I was very excited about that. So you've been really busy, Shanae, over the past few months. Um, how do you decide which events to go to? Which ones you're gonna attend? And is there a process for this? Yeah, well, I must say my plans have changed a little bit this year, um, but I wouldn't say they've changed for the worst. I um, I pretty much go through the year and plan what I want to do, but I'm very open-minded to change. So I was meant to do Sydney for Star Long and then go overseas. Um, but when I didn't quite get that qualification, I decided to stay and do Melbourne three-day event which I'm very glad that I stayed and did where I think we should stop on that moment for a bit (laughs) and give you a huge congratulations for your win at the four star long at Melbourne I mean what an achievement that was which is absolutely incredible um and through the past few events that you've done you've said that you've really enjoyed your dressage and that's shown Um, you're always leading in the dressage. So, I mean, talk about consistency right there. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was pretty awesome. So where are you going to now? So you've you've decided to reroute from Sydney, gone to Melbourne um, and cemented a really great performance. Um, We're recording this at the beginning of July and the um, World Championships are coming up in September. So what are you going to do between now and then? And uh, what, are you, what are your plans? And then looking to, we've got a games in another couple of years. Like how do you prepare and what are you aiming for while you've got a horse that's, um, is he 11, your boy? Yes, 11. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So you've got heaps of time um, on your side in terms of him being a really good age. How do you plan and what events do you think you'll be looking for, um, say, between now and the next games? Um, well, just going off this year, I... I um, have got my World Games qualification, so I'm very much set on that selection. Um, I'm going to run him at Corindai, which is mid-August, just in the four-star short. And Mm -hmm. then just, he really only needs one more event, really. I'd say he's had a pretty big year and he is quite a consistent horse. Um, Mm -hmm. so just to run him around Corinda and then do some show jumping events, hopefully Mm -hmm. I'll go in a plan. Um, we go to the world games in September. Um, but if not, I will toss up whether I still get on the plane and do Po five star as Mm -hmm. that would be pretty cool. Um, and it will be my first five star with, with him, with for myself and the horse. So um but yeah that that will pretty much be the plan for this year and then going on next year i will aim to do the five star at adelaide which is being run in april now you know how adelaide was always in november so i just wanted to ask you what you thought about it now being in april so our eventing season starts like more beginning of march um is that going to be a tricky one to prep for yeah well i guess it means that um you would have to start your prep probably a bit earlier. Uh, I don't think it's it's going to make a huge amount of difference unless you are chasing a qualifier. Like if you were wanting to do, um, 
if you needed Sydney and Melbourne to get you qualified for Adelaide, then you can't really do that all in the same year anymore. So that's probably the only downfall with having it in April. Um, but if you have a horse that's qualified and it probably still gives you a few events to do. So I don't see it as being a problem. And if anything, we might not get the heat waves that we can get. So that might be um, a bit better as well for Adelaide being in April. But um, yeah, it, it, it's always an amazing event. So I think whether being in November and April, it will, November or April, it will still be as good as it always is. It is pretty cool, isn't it? Like, Bex, you really should come. It's amazing. It's right in the middle of the city and it's so amazing that the general public can literally walk straight off the road and see horses galloping through their main, it's like the botanical gardens in the middle of um, Adelaide. So it's it's really phenomenal. And you can just walk to the main street, go and have wow. this incredible dinner, then go back and do your riding. That sounds amazing, horses galloping through the city. Do They must have all the parks going through the city then. They don't just put down turf on the main roads. No, they have like, uh, I think it's like, a, I'm going to guess and say it's like four main parks and then they link them. So yeah, they put yeah. um, big mesh gates around the whole lot so that it's all um, it's all contained and then put um, sand surface across all of the bitumen roads. So you can just wow, keep hammering from one park straight across the straight across the road um, into the next oh, park. But yeah, it's amazing. That sounds that's insane. Really amazing. Yeah. That's Pretty much insane. the whole city is on lockdown for that weekend. Yep. <laughs> Is it? Yeah. <laughs> nice. Nice. <laughs> um, we've oh, already covered cool. Sinead, um when you winning at Melbourne, which is an amazing achievement. And I mentioned about your dressage diva skills um, and how you've been leading in your last two four stars. So do you want to just give the listeners some secrets and tips on how you unleash your inner dressage diva? <laughs> Um, I think like I wouldn't, yeah, I, I guess I just really enjoy the phase is probably the word. Um, I enjoy working on it nearly every day. You do flight work most days of the week. Um, I just find I'm, yeah, consistent in that phase because I really do enjoy it at the end of the day and I, I enjoy to work hard at it. Um, like my horse bold venture I have at the moment is only a thoroughbred. Um, he isn't a bad mover at all, but he wasn't a natural at dressage, but just throughout the years, I just chipped away and, you know, used my coaches like Prue Barrett and now Bettina Hoy as well as Prue, um, who have really helped me um, have the system that I have now. So yeah, I just really enjoy it and I like working hard at it is pretty much um, all I can say. <laughs> and I don't think, like when you said, oh, he's only a thoroughbred, like I watched him at Melbourne and he's a lovely type and he's a really good mover and you have him in a really, like he, he travels in a really nice frame. And um, my last little Coco Popping Candy that I had shortlisted for Tokyo, she's also a thoroughbred. But I must say sometimes I think that, um, the thoroughbred work ethic is just so incredible and you can school them and they don't tire. And I personally, I don't know how you feel, but sitting on a really nice lightweight thoroughbred who um, is super expressive and providing they're nice and soft and supple and obedient, I just think they're the most incredible horses to ride on the flat. And like for eventing, they just don't, they don't tire. And your guy, I saw him galloping through the finish at Melbourne too and it just looked magical to sit on. <laughs> Yeah, well, definitely what you said then, just having that work ethic and, yeah, just just his willingness to learn as well is is really um, special. Um, just being able to put them under a bit of pressure as well and they just accept it is always really nice and that's, that's what you need, I guess, when you're doing that level of a test. Um, but, yeah, I do love a good thoroughbred. <laughs> So, Sinead, talking about your recent win at Melbourne 3 Day, I think it's actually quite a, an interesting and quite a special um, fact that you beat your, I suppose, long-time mentor, Shane Rose, who you also mentioned that you've been working for for years. Um, it's a very special sport when you can beat your sort of coach mentor boss and still get along incredibly well and be very supportive of each other. Um, how did that feel? How Was that quite amazing to actually beat Shane? 
I guess I never really looked at it, my win, and went, I can't believe I beat Shane. But um, I must say it's something that does not happen very often. He is such a such a good competitor. I highly rate his competitiveness. And um, I guess it was really quite special at Melbourne because I had been – working with him for the past two years at Bimbadeen Park and he was very influential for that success. He was very supportive of me throughout the whole preparation and I think um, when I got the win he was he was happy for me and it was it was really special actually. I was it was a great feeling and I'm very, very appreciative of his support that he's given me. So Again, it doesn't happen very often, but it was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, it was an absolutely sensational effort by both, I must say. It's very exciting for Australia with the World Championships coming up to have you two put in such a good performance. So, Sinead, in your interview with an event called Life at Melbourne, you mentioned that you'd be leaving Australia to go overseas to the UK and face with Sammy Birch. Do you have any updates on this? Or how are your pre preparations going? Yeah, well... Um, those plans have changed just slightly as I'm now staying in Australia for my preparation. Um, I unfortunately won't be going to Sammy Birch's this year. Um, however, I hopefully in the near future will still get the chance to go over there. Um, so the horse has had a, a well earned little break and he's now currently back in work. So I'll just keep ticking him over and get him ready for the next event and wait and see what happens. It sounds fantastic. And it's really good that you can change. And I mean, ideally going to the UK would be fantastic and a really nice insight into international competition, but um, still fantastic that we can prep from here. And if you go back to Bimberdeen for that short period of time for you and Shane prepping together, which I'm sure helps to raise the bar. Absolutely. Um, what else do you have to look into, Shanae? So we're, obviously you are talking about your trip to, from Perth to Sydney. How, is there anything different that, I mean, I can think of a couple of things like horse passports um, when you have to plan for going <laughs> overseas? And also I'm sure that you've got things um, planning if you do get chosen to the World Championships. So can you sort of um, tell some of our listeners what are those things that you've got to plan for in advance to travel overseas? I think the major... Um... The major things that I learned with traveling overseas was the amount of vaccinations that your horse has to go through and that they are really planned out vaccinations as well. Like it's not, it wasn't a needle that they can get, you know, a week before they get on the plane. They're usually a two or three dose needle that are taken 30 to 40 days apart. So you have to make sure that you allow enough times, enough time in your planning to get all those vaccinations complete and I think the last vaccination which was the encephalitis I think which is a Japanese encephalitis um, they can't travel until 50 days or so after the last dose so that was a big um, mm. eye-opener for me which um, mm -hmm. no it's it was really interesting to learn all of that and mm. I guess yeah putting them on a plane for I haven't even done the flight to Europe so it will be um, <laughs> quite exciting for the both of us, I think. Um, yeah. Will you get to fly with the horses, do you think? Well, I don't exactly know that information, but um, I believe that either yourself or your groom can, and I would love to be on the flight. Um, so I, I believe there's a flight at the end of August. I'm not exactly sure when, and that flies straight into Frankfurt is in Germany. Well, that would be super exciting for you to be able to get on a plane and go. And I know that um, there were a few things that until you do them um, and then you learn from them, you, you're just not aware of. Because in Australia, like Bex, I know you guys are injecting, um, was it twice a year for flu and it has to go onto their passports and it has to be stamped. It has to be a certain vet that does it, whereas mm -hmm. we just don't have that. And I know that one mm -hmm. um, colleague of mine um, in prepping to go overseas, there were two different injections and they needed to all be a certain time apart that 
um, because he didn't have as much time, those injections were a little bit close and then they were close to an event and the horse was actually a little bit flat from having those injections. So if you've got preparation events, you have to be mindful, obviously, of, that you don't give them vaccinations that are quite close. It can end up making them feel a little bit flat and then you either can't run or they don't run very well and there's so much timing that goes into it, isn't there, Sinead? Yes, 100%. Right, okay, well, should we wrap this up with just a quick quiz I yeah think the listeners would like to know a little bit more about you um um i just need you to answer these in just a few words so shanae if you had a spirit animal what would it be <laughs> um wow i have never been asked that question um <laughs> probably a cheetah or something that's really fast mm-hmm. that's nice what song best matches your horse's personality? My horse has a very interesting personality. He's a lovely horse, but he he's um, quite a quirky horse. So it'd have to be a song in a quirky category. And I can't quite think of one. <laughs> what is the one thing you can't go to a competition without, Shanae? It would have to be my bait saddles because I have, well, my partner, Sam, forgot to put my bait saddle in Bentley's bait saddle in at a competition earlier this year and it was nearly a disaster but luckily I could um change the gullet and it all worked out fine in the end oh my god how lucky is that because like that is what is so awesome about those bait saddles (laughs) wow that is a serious bacon saver you're like it's fine it's still my saddle I'll just change the gullet I'll just change the gullet on it and I can totally adjust it to fit him. And then we can crack on. Fantastic. Another one yep, for it was all fine. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Cool. So over here in England, um, we, we always give our, our horses polo mints. That's like our treat. So when they come out of the ring or when they've done good. Um, what's your go-to treat for your horses in Australia? Um, mine is licorice. My horse loves licorice. He gets it every time after he's worked. Bex, you don't have licorice over there for horses, do you? They don't quite have the same breath as my horses then. We don't do that. Nobody does that, no. <laughs> um, like we, we just use polo mints or extra strong mints. Oh, so we don't have mints over here. Licorice is probably better for them, but their teeth <laughs> would be all black. That's how I figure. Yeah, I have never fed my horses mints, but I'm going to try it. No, that is our go-to. We buy like five packets at a time, like loads of rolls of mints. If you don't have mints, <laughs> when the horse comes out of the ring, say, but you've got mint. You guys have sticky licorice. Doesn't it all kind of melt on your yeah. fingers? And like like stick to each other and just come out in big gloopy. Yeah. But especially yeah. because of the heat. My horses have a mixture of treats. I don't know what you do, Sinead. I have like a container that's got the licorice in it. And yes, Bex, you are right on there because in summer it does get a bit sticky. So I have other treats that can stay in the truck all the time. And they're like the dry treats. So when it's really disgusting, mm. we don't feed the licorice. We go with the other ones. But yeah, Sinead, they do love licorice, don't they? You can smell it on their breath from a mile away. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, love it. Oh, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Sinead, for chatting with us and um, so exciting to chat to you about where you're at in the Australian elite eventing scene and um, just so much luck to you with the World Championships coming up. I hope that you get a gig because it's um, such a wonderful opportunity and your horse seems to be, or you and your horse are really firing at the right time. So thank you. Congratulations. Um, Fingers crossed for you. And anyway, we'll do a bit of a close up. So this has been the Equestrian Experience with myself, Amanda Ross, my co-host, Bex Mason, and this episode's guest, Sinead Lowings. To send in your questions for our upcoming episodes, enter our competitions and access our other episodes, be sure to visit the equestrianexperiencepodcast.com. You can also follow us at Amanda Ross Equestrian and at Bex Mason SJ and find Sinead at Sinead Lowings Eventing. Up until next time, have a great equestrian experience. See you later, ladies. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye, see you, Bye. Bye.